Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well, whizzing by, Christmas beckoning. As I've said many times and on last time on the 13th of August, the most important currency to watch right now remains the renminbi and uh, that's I think the ultimate signal in all the noise and that's currently at 7.03. Uh, 75 and there were some emollient comments from Xi Jinping overnight. Home thoughts, Elizabeth I was born in 1533, she was crowned in the Abbey in 1559 and is buried in the Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey and yesterday I was talking to a gentleman uh, who was a friend of another fellow called Valentine Cecil, and he said when he toured um, the residence, he was taken around uh, the house, and then he was sat on a bench, and Valentine's brother described to him that it was on this bench that Elizabeth I heard about Mary, Queen of Scots. Quite interesting. And this is a photograph I took of the Westminster cloisters, I was at Westminster School and used to walk along those cloisters into the Abbey every morning. Such a strong signal has never been measured in ground-based gamma ray astronomy. This is the first time. For the first time, astrophysicists have observed a cosmic explosion emit particles that are a trillion times more energetic than visible light, a record-setting measurement from a phenomenon that scientists are still seeking to fully understand. These explosions are GRBs and they produce short-lived jets of extremely energetic light. GRBs may also occur when two neutron stars collide happen on a daily basis and release as much energy in a few seconds as our sun will emit in its entire 10 billion years of life. Isn't that extraordinary? And that took me to, of course, Jaladin Rumi. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. The actual technical note is in Nature magazine, Terra electron volt emission from the Y-ray burst GRB 190114C. Long duration Y-ray bursts are the most luminous sources of electromagnetic radiation known in the universe. They arise from outflows of plasma with velocities near the speed of light that are ejected by newly formed neutron stars or black holes of stellar mass at cosmological distances, prompt flashes of mega electron volt energy Y rays are followed by a longer lasting afterglow emission in a wide range of energies from radio waves to giga electron volt Y rays. Quite an extraordinary story and people have been wondering about these bursts of energy for a long time. Political reflections, I return to man underscore integrated, BRI is the artery, missiles are the blood, talking about China. Um, and um, I wrote a piece on the 7th of October, China turned 70. I was quoting Hugh, who said, this is the legendary DF-41 ICBM, but it is not a tale. Today it is displayed at Tiananmen Square. I touched one about four years ago in the production plant. No need to fear it, just respect it and respect China that owns it. The Economist, China's unruly periphery, resents the Communist Party's heavy hand. After more than five months of anti-government unrest in Hong Kong, the stakes are turning deadly. Despite the violence, public support for the protesters, even the bomb-throwing radicals, remain strong. Citizens may turn out in force for local elections on November 24th. 
which have taken on new significance as a test of the popular will and a chance to give pro-establishment candidates a drubbing. Protesters say they want nothing less than democracy. They cannot pick their chief executive. And elections for Hong Kong's legislature are, widel, are wildly tilted. So the protests may continue. The Communist Party in Beijing does not seem eager to get its troops to crush the unrest. Far from it, insiders say, this is a problem that the party does not want to own. The economic and political costs of mass firing into crowds in a global financial centre would be huge, but own the problem it does. The heavy-handedness of China's leader Xi Jinping and public resentment of it is a primary cause of the turmoil. He says he wants a great rejuvenation of his country, but his brutal, uncompromising approach to control is feeding anger, not just in Hong Kong, but all around China's periphery. When Mao Zedong's guerrillas seized power in China in 1949, they did not take over a clearly defined country, much less an entirely willing one. Hong Kong was ruled by the British, nearby Macau by the Portuguese, Taiwan was under the control of the nationalist government Mao had just overthrown. The mountain terrain of Tibet was under a Buddhist theocracy that chafed at control from Beijing. Communist troops had yet to enter another immense region in the far west, Xinjiang, where Muslim ethnic groups did not want to be ruled from afar. Today's Hong Kong, tomorrow's Taiwan is a popular slogan in Hong Kong that resonates with its intended audience, Taiwanese voters. Tibet and Xinjiang are quiet, but only because people there have been terrorized into silence. Officials say this vocational training, as they chillingly describe it, necessary to eradicate Islamist extremism, in the long run, it is more likely to fuel rage that will one day explode. The slogan in Hong Kong has another part. Today's Xinjiang, tomorrow's Hong Kong. But Hong Kongers are right to view the party with fear. Even if Mr. Z decides not to use troops in Hong Kong, his view of challenges to the party's authority is clear. He thinks they should be crushed. China is likely to lean harder on Hong Kong's government to explore whether it can pass a harsh new anti-sedition law and to require students to submit it to patriotic education, i.e. party propaganda. The party wants to know the names of those who defy it, the better to make their lives miserable later. More likely, if the party remains in power that long, Mao's unfinished business will remain a terrible sore. Millions of people living in the outlying regions that Mao claimed for the party will be seething. Not all the communist elite agree with Mr. Z's clenched fist approach, which is presumably why someone leaked the Xinjiang papers. Trouble in the periphery of an empire can swiftly spread to the centre. In Hong Kong, one country, two systems is officially due to expire in 2047. On current form, its system is likely to be much like the rest of China's long before then. That is why Hong Kong's protesters are so desperate and why the harmony Mr. Z talks so blithely of creating in China will elude him. I have written March 2018, China has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang. Dissent is measured and snuffed out very quickly in China. A combination of data from video surveillance, face and license plate recognition, mobile device locations, official records identify targets for detention. And I said then, Xinjiang is surely a precursor for how the CCP will manage dissent. The actions in Xinjiang are part of the regional authorities' ongoing strike-hard campaign. <clears throat>
and Z, stability, maintenance and enduring peace drive in the region. 21st of October this year, I said, unless we're now going to Xinjiang the whole world, the current modus operandi is running on empty. <coughs> in Xinjiang, via report from Haretz.com, children are being taken from their parents who are confined in concentration camps and being put in Chinese orphanages. Women in the camps are receiving inoculations that make them infertile. And I concluded that the current modus operandi is running on empty. In the same article, I was quoting Xi Jinping himself, who called himself the crusher of bones. And I was talking about his algorithmic control. I've also said the Chinese dream has become a nightmare at the boundaries of the Han Empire. And I am sure Xi sees Hong Kong and Taiwan like a virus <coughs> and he is looking to impose a quarantine just like he has imposed on Xinjiang. He is building an algorithmic society. Fiona Hill was the latest uh, witness uh, in these ongoing impeachment hearings. In the course of this investigation, I would ask that you please not promote politically driven falsehoods that so clearly advance Russian interests. She is a British-born coal miner's daughter with a PhD from Harvard, a respected Russia expert, former intelligence analyst and co-author of a 500-page book analyzing the psyche of Vladimir Putin. From that article, you go and tell Eisenberg that I am not part of whatever drug deal Sonland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this, she recalled Mr. Bolton saying. This is a fictional narrative that has been perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services themselves. A key talking point is CrowdStrike, a security firm hired by the DNC that detected the hack. Hill um, warned in forensic and measured terms that such a rumour-mongering only empowers the Russian president. The impact of the successful 2016 Russian campaign remains evident today, she said. Our nation is being torn apart. Truth is questioned. Our highly professional and expert career foreign service is being undermined. U.S. support for Ukraine, which continues to face armed Russian aggression, has been politicized. And I take you back to December 2016 when I wrote about this and I quoted Don DeLillo, we have a deviate tomahawk. There's a voice. We have gross oscillation here. And I said then my starting point is the election of President Trump because hindsight will surely show that the Russians ran a seriously sophisticated program of interference, mostly digital. I quoted DeLillo, the specialist is monitoring data on his mission console when a voice breaks in, a voice that carried with it a strange and unspecifiable poignancy. We have gross oscillation here. The voice, in contrast to Colorado's metallic pigeon, is a melange of repartee, laughter and song with a quality of purest, sweetest sadness. And I said then, I have no doubt that Putin ran a 21st century predominantly digital program of interference which amplified the Trump candidacy. Trump was an ideal candidate for this kind of support. I said the first thing is plausible deniability. The second thing is non-linearity. I quoted Beppe Grillo, this is the deflagration of an epoch. It's the apocalypse of this information system, of the TVs, of the big newspapers, of the intellectuals, of the journalists. From feeding the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online, a constant uh, state of destabilized perception, timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks, which drained Hillary's bona fides and her turnout and motivated Trump's. What we have witnessed is something remarkable and noteworthy. Putin has proven himself an information master and his adversaries are his information victims, the American people, in point of fact. 
Fiona Hill, based on questions and statements I have heard, some of you on the, this committee appear to believe that Russia and the security services did not conduct a campaign against our country and that perhaps somehow for some reason Ukraine did. This is a fictional narrative. We followed the President's orders, was the New York Times' front page. As I said in November, early November, the Republican Party will be making a hard-nosed political calculation this weekend. Dan Rather, the question is not whether the GOP will abandon Trump, we know the answer. The question is whether the country will abandon the GOP. Interestingly, ASAP Rocky has entered US history as more than just a rapper. His name keeps appearing during testimony related to the House impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Netanyahu becomes the first sitting Prime Minister in Israel's history to be charged with bribery in a case involving quid pro quo with a telecom tycoon. His defense has been that it is allowed to receive gifts from friends, according to his lawyers. Gary Kasparov, the point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda, it is to exhaust your critical thinking to annihilate the truth. And have a read of Paul Virilio's The Administration of Fear. Charlie Robertson, referencing 1957-1958 Lords of the Desert, the Americans want regime change in Syria, so do the Saudis, Turkey is ready to invade, the Russians are propping up the regime in Damascus, Lebanon is getting very messy indeed. And as I've said previously, Trump has been a big proponent of coercive financial and sanction warfare and its expression vis-a-vis -vis Iran is its apogee. Crude oil exports on which Iran relies for much of its hard currency earnings have fallen to about 250,000 barrels per day from a peak of 2.5 million barrels per day in April last year. As I wrote and quoted Hunter S. Thompson in May this year, there is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is, this is the edge, are the ones who have gone over and Iran has been pushed to that edge. I did say if the US thinks Tehran will just roll over, which appears to be the case, then they're exhibiting the same deluded ideas that they exhibited a day before the peacock throne got plucked. Iran, I said, is a geopolitical bleeding edge. The IMF has forecast a 9.5% contraction for Iran this year, amid 36% inflation that's eating away at incomes. Andrew Corribico, Iran's protests are grassroots, not foreign-driven, and that's the real problem. Although the US is most directly responsible for Iran's economic woes over the past few years, the politically inconvenient fact of the matter is that its sanctioned policy has indeed succeeded in creating the conditions whereby people naturally take to the streets and protest from time to time. <coughs> and especially after so-called trigger events such as the latest fuel price hike. And uh, I spoke about the new economy of anger. Uh, Andrew Korobika is also saying the Lebanese color revolution is a defining moment for the resistance. What originally began as an expression of legitimate outrage at the Mideast country's dysfunctional government and endemic corruption quickly transformed into a color revolution. He's referencing Nasrallah who warned participants against becoming useful idiots in the US, Israel and GCC's plot against their homeland. You will recall Pompeo ominously hinted at an ultimatum being made to Lebanon during his visit there in March when he thundered that Lebanon faces a choice, bravely move forward as an independent and proud nation or allow the dark ambitions of Iran and Hezbollah to dictate your future, which strongly suggests that the US at the very least tacitly had a hand in guiding developments. 
Um, I wrote about the WhatsApp revolution in Lebanon and I said, and this references not only Lebanon but the entire revolutionary ferment that we've encountered, prolonged standoffs, eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. I quoted Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production but in the street where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. I love this song by Ronnie Sekaili, uh, Revolution Radio Mix via SoundCloud, that's on Rich Wrap Ups as well. But my point is the risks are that we cannot manage what Trump and Pompeo have started with their maximum pressure strategy. And really what we're seeing across the world, in my opinion, I agree with this article in Middle East Eye, the wave of protest shaking the world resembles a global uprising against neoliberalism. Protests in Iraq and Lebanon, while domestic in origin, could yet have dire geopolitical consequences in the framework of an enduring confrontation between the so-called Arab NATO and axis of resistance led by Iran and comprising Syria, Iraq and Lebanon, which is shaping regional dynamics. Behind such legitimate and genuine protests, however, there could also be a hidden agenda aimed at manipulating public rage to score political points. I think that's exactly what's happening. This represents the thorn in the side of the US, Israel and Arab countries affiliated with them, Arab NATO. The axis of resistance has systematically opposed the Pax Americana in the Middle East. If a new civil war is ignited in Iraq or Lebanon in the end, after a bloodbath, only the more resilient and determined groups will prevail. And these might well be the members of the axis of resistance. Pursuing hybrid warfare through additional financial sanctions would only lead to collapse in Lebanon, in Iraq. It would further increase the Iranian, Russian and Chinese presence in the country. So, you know, I think that's precisely the point and I think the feedback loop and the risks of dieback where we enter a phase of cascading system collapse which we then can't control is very high indeed. I look at this from Joshua Potash, something is sweeping South America and the world. This is Colombia protesting their far-right government today. As I said, the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire. This is a revolution, it is a global phenomenon. And let me finish on this point with Kapuczynski, who says, if the crowd disperses and goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over, I said it is not over and more and more people are gathering in the streets practically everywhere in the world. Let's move on to the markets. Uh, Euro dollar 110.72, dollar index 97.942, Japanese yen 108.61. It's, it's, it's uh, coiling within a very tight range. Swiss franc 0.9943, the pound 129.18, the Australian dollar um, 0 0.6800, India rupee 71.837, South Korean won 11.7801, Brazilian real 4.1933, Egyptian pound 16.1097, and the rand, which has gone towards the top of the range now, which is 14.50, is at 14.6521. Dollar index just below 98. Euro dollar, this is from FX Pip Titan, last at 110.73. That too is moving in a very tight range. Have a look at his chart. Sterling, 129.17. It has risen like a phoenix from multi year lows and has room to rally further, particularly if Boris Johnson's able to build a big lead. Bitcoin, which spiked by 40%, you will recall, in just 24 hours on comments made by Xi Jinping. Then in the ensuing four weeks, Bitcoin steadily lost 100% of those gains. This is a classic pump and dump. Run the price up to sucker in momentum buyers, then sell into that demand. Peter Schiff. Bitcoin is last trading at 7,525. 
30th of September, I said the end is nigh. Bitcoin could fall, in fact, as far as $1,000 where it was in January 2016. It's down 20% in less than one month. 4th of November, I said I'm of the view that Bitcoin and cryptos are Jeffrey Edward Epstein and his cast of characters level con. It's breathtaking and I'm having nothing to do with it other than occasionally looking in and admiring the sophistication and the level of the con. It's breathtaking. I then referenced you crypto deleted a tweet via Bruce Fenton, uh, which was deleted after 38 minutes and was basically connecting Epstein with Bitcoin. WeWork Bond has hit a fresh low at 69.7 cents. That's now in Lebanon and Zambian territory. Commodity markets risk on, gold down, risk off, gold down, new normal, asks the market here. We're currently at 14.67 and 50 cents. Oil, extraordinary, now at 58 dollars and 28 cents. It remains in the channel, up almost four dollars in two days. Hit the bottom of the channel, now he's hit the top, all in the space of a week. But if you look at the uncertainty in the globe and in many oil producing regions, you've got to say people have been looking at demand, whereas they should be looking at supply. If you look at supply, oil is going higher. Emerging markets, a decade after the global recession, is a new book by the World Bank, which says the e emerging markets did well during the GFC because it had policy space, fiscal and monetary and was ready to absorb shock. This is from Trinomics. Fast forward a decade, the EM market is not so resilient, meaning winter is coming and we've burned all the woods. And I agree with that. And I spoke about that in an article about the feedback loop phenomenon. When I was saying China has exerted the power of pull, it was a positive power on EM, Asia, frontier markets, creating a positive feedback loop. And I said, that's now, that two decade long phenomenon is now in reverse. 19th of August, I said, emerging and frontier markets look in big trouble this time around. Turning to Sub-Saharan Africa, Angola raised $3 billion from yield-starved bond investors. Buyers were drawn in by the chunky yields on offer, 8% for the 10-year debt and 9.125% for 30-year debt. There has been a genuine change in Angola, a clear out of the old guard and a more professional approach to running the public finances, said Kieran Curtis, a fund manager at Aberdeen Standard Investments, who bought bonds in the sale. It's not an uncontroversial story because the debt stock is so high, but the yield is very attractive. Debt issuance by frontier economies, a grouping of lower rated emerging nations that typically lure investors by paying higher yields is on course to equal 2017's record of $38 billion. There can be too much of a good thing, the IMF said earlier this week. Countries that don't put the money to good use may have trouble servicing their loans and find themselves at risk of default. The country's currency, the Kwanzaa, has plunged since it was allowed to float freely last month and is down roughly a third against the dollar this year. Riaz Gilani tweeted a clip from the budget, let the Zimbabwe space race begin. They allocated money to go to space. 21st of January, I said, what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. That tipping point moment was, you know, I remember it in the Jasmine Revolution in Tunis when the crowds chanted, we're not afraid, we're not afraid, we are afraid only of God. That is the moment it tips and you haven't got there yet and that's why you're seeing these brutal uh, repression in the street. Zimbabwe on the 29th of July, I called it a laboratory experiment with inflation at that time clocking 176%. According to Steve Hankey, inflation is now at 574%. Letter from Africa, Zimbabwe, the land where cash barons thrive, 
Uh, for example, you go into a supermarket to buy a fifth to buy a loaf of bread, you can pay 15 Zim dollars in cash, 18 in mobile money, or 20 by debit card. Therefore, I, the same point I made in January where I said, look, there is a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions. And I was quoting Yuval Harari, who said, money is accordingly a system of mutual trust not just any system of mutual trust, money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. And basically, there is no mutual trust in Zimbabwe. The mind game that ZANU-PF played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. Of course, President Manangagwa was in Dubai sharing our story and incredible potential with entrepreneurs and investors. I will continue to toil both at home and abroad to put Zimbabwe back on its feet, he said. 9th of September, I said, Manangagwa, Manangagwa who is eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. <clears throat> yeah, 14th of October, but previous to that, I'd been alerting everybody to the risks in Zambia. I said, the canary in the coal mine is Zambia. I was quoting Charlie Robertson, investors have lost faith in government promises to get spending under control and the government has fallen out with the IMF as well. IMF uh, stressed the need for a large front-loaded and sustained fiscal adjustment um, uh, uh, that would help set debt on a downward path and reduce domestic arrears. Press release number 19426 that was issued yields on Zambia's 2022 euro bond uh, spiked yesterday. This is from Taonga Clifford. The Chicago skyline note, just Zambia's quacha that got a bad case of the depreciation blues. Zambian quacha, this is another chart from Taonga Clifford. So we're seeing that melt down now. South African all shares up 7.21% year-to-date, dollar rand 14.6383. Egyptian tourism revenue surges to a record. Tourism makes up 15% of Egypt's economy. was badly shaken by the 2011 uprising. Um, as security has improved, tourists have returned. Earnings were over $12.5 billion in the 2018-2019 fiscal year. Egypt is properly an investor's darling. Egyptian pound 16.11, EGX 30 up 8.12%. Nigeria's economy grew 2.3% year on year in the third quarter, faster than the pace of 2.1% in quarter two. Nigeria all shares down 14.5% year to date. Ghana stock exchange is down 14.5% as well. A former president's crocodiles are terrorizing Ivory Coast capital. Once they guarded his palace, now they prey on pedestrians. The first president of the Ivory Coast, Felix Hufwe Boini, liked to build monuments to himself. After independence, he erected a new political capital on top of his remote home village, Yamusukro. No expense was spared. He equipped the city with a Concord runway. West Africa's first ice skating rink, the largest basilica in the world and a grand palace surrounded by an artificial lake filled with crocodiles. Since the president's death in 1993, officials have preferred to work in the commercial capital Abidjan, leaving the political capital to fall into disrepair. Potholed roads and broken street lights are not the only problems locals face. The president's pets have escaped into the city's waterways and reproduced. There has been no policy for the crocodiles. If you go near the water, they will eat you. A fret Suaga Gerard, a teacher. The crocodiles were gifts from Musa Traore, the brutal dictator of Mali. It was a sort of, this is how I deal with my enemies gesture, says a Western diplomat. For more than three decades, they were looked after by a wiry keeper, Diko Toki. He gave them names like Capitan and Chef de Cabinet and kept them in check with a blunt machete. In 2012, however, Mr. Toki was allegedly dragged out into the lake by Chef de Cabinet, never to be seen again. In the wild, crocodiles can get by with only the occasional meal, the oxen that the presidency buys to feed them every month, 
ought to be enough to satisfy even the hungriest of them. Alas, irresponsible tourists have developed the habit of paying locals good money, around $5 a chomp, to see them gobble down live chickens. This rich diet has allowed the animals to grow and multiply. There were about 20 originally, but no one knows how many they are now or how many people they've killed. It is particularly dangerous in the rainy seasons when there are floods, says Mr. Gerard. In most cities in Africa, hardly anyone would shed a tear at the removal of cold-blooded killers or their conversion into stylish handbags. But Yamasukro's crocs have a sacred aura, thanks to the big man who, to whom they once belonged. Some say anyone who does them harm will be cursed, so when they come out of the water looking for a snack, the palace guards do not shoot them. Instead, firemen are called to put them gingerly back. V.S. Naipaul wrote a tremendous article about the crocodiles of Yamasukro. Then he says people were th known to throw a live chicken to eat in front of an audience. Naipaul talks to people about other strange happenings and then puts the events side by side to see if they shed light on one another. His questions keep leading to the world of night, the world of darkness as one African calls it, the world of animistic belief and supposed supernatural powers. Many of the people he talks to are foreigners who have chosen to live here and who love it. Um, but basically that is another great uh, a story that he wrote um, and he's such a tremendous writer as well. Kenya Cash Crunch pushes Kenya to edge with curb in job creation. Bloomberg, central government and county authorities were yet to pay suppliers and contractors at least $1.7 billion as of June with amounts due from national ministries, departments and agencies almost double from a year earlier. Additionally, business cash flows are suffering from the state providing only about half of the money required for tax refunds every month. This has led to a negative impact on the economy, including less than optimal levels of employment and escalation of poverty, Acting Treasury Secretary Yuko Yatani said from the capital Nairobi. Private sector activity, which is the main employer, has slowed remarkably, said Faith Atiti, a senior economist at NCBA Bank. Fixed capital formation in the area has literally stunted, if not contracted. Kenya will spend 696.6 billion shillings, equivalent to 39% of the revenue target on servicing debt in the year through June. I take you back to Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities as the preacher, vanity of vanities as the preacher, all is vanity. As I said in that article and I was writing about Africa in general, it seems to me that we're at a pivot moment. We can keep regurgitating the same old mantras like a stuck record, and if we do that, this turns Aussie Mandy has. Nairobi all shares up 10.38% year to date. Kenyan banks' non-performing loans remain elevated despite strong economic growth, a credit negative, says Moody's. South Africa's Standard Bank is set to embark on a new phase of buying shares in Standard Kenya at a cost of $24 million, with the target of raising its stake in the lender to 75% by December 2020. Standard share price data is on the website, trades on a trading P of 6.8, price to book of 1, and is an attractive share. NSE 20 is down 7.41% year to date. And with that, I wish you a tremendous weekend.